our first speakers who will give uh, in introductory comments uh, about the international presence of Georgia Tech, uh, as well as the global involvement of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and will share their vision of global engineering leadership. Dr. Don Webster is the chair of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. He, uh, he was instrumental in creating the environmental undergraduate program and is a champion of the flipped class model. Uh, his research pertains to turbulent flow uh, with application to animal fluid interactions, as one can see from the number of Latin words on his website. <laughs> Dr. Yves Bertolo is the president of Georgia Tech Lorraine in France and the vice provost for international initiatives. He got his first engineering degree in France another master's degree from the UK and a PhD from the US that tells you how global Professor Bertolo is. His expertise is in acoustics and dynamics and he's been at Tour de Tech since 1985. So I'm very pleased uh, to have our two first speakers uh, say a few words and I will let the floor to you too. Okay, I think I'm think I uh, I'm, I'm going first so I'll, I'll um take the floor. Um, first of all, I want to say a few notes of appreciation. Um, thank you, Professor Winans and his team for, for bringing us into the fold on the, the Leadership Minor program uh, a number of years ago. And uh, as I'll comment in just a few moments here, uh, I think we've had some good success with uh, the Global Engineering Leadership Minor. Uh, thanks also to Adjo Amakuzi Kennedy um, for, for leading the program and to all the instructors who have been delivering the, the course content. And, um, and then finally, Chloe, thank you for, to you and the um, uh, International Initiatives Committee for organizing this event. Uh, we haven't had anything quite like this so far, so I, I really appreciate the, the forum to, to have a discussion around uh, uh, the, the minor program. Um, so just a few comments about the, uh, let's see if this will advance. It doesn't seem to want to. Um, hmm. oh, there we go. Um, so uh, just a few comments about the program itself. Uh, so as many of you know, the, the Global Engineering Leadership Minor is one of three uh, leadership uh, minor tracks at the Institute. And it's the one that really has the strongest uh, engineering focus, um, as you can see on the slide. Uh, the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering has been the, the home of the program, but as Chloe noted, uh, the, it's open to students in, in other programs. And uh, you know, I think as we go forward, there, there may be some opportunities for um, instructors in other programs to deliver uh, content in very nicely to the, the suite of, of course options. Uh, the courses are really um, structured around uh, fundamental principles of leadership, which is ta taught uh, by Wes uh, in the public po policy uh, school. And then also um, the global engineering uh, leadership uh, course itself, which uh, Rudy Bonaparte and Lisa Rosenstein ha have been teaching. And the rest of the curriculum uh, has some flexibility to it uh, and uh, really consists of the courses that are framed around the grand uh, challenge concepts. Uh, but what's really important is that um, uh, the courses uh, really incorporate the leadership training as well as the, the global um, perspectives into the, the technical content. Um, and there's some other um, aspects as well. The global practicum is a, is a key piece to it. Uh, as well as the, the Hyatt Lecture Series, which I'm going to uh, speak on uh, in a moment. Uh, we have a couple new courses, which, which are not formally part of this program quite yet, but, um, but have some adjacencies that, that may lend themselves to, to the program down the line. Uh, one is the Infrastructure Finance course that we piloted last uh, spring, and the second is the uh, Innovations and Entrepreneurship course that, again, we, we piloted last spring. Um, so just a few highlights, the, the, uh, the program itself is to develop engineers who lead and contribute effectively to addressing the global grand challenges and to other societal problems in domestic and international context, uh, working effectively across cultures. And so that's uh, a, a very comprehensive uh, set of uh, objectives. And you can see the specific uh, goals that are, that are listed um, before, excuse me, below. 
um, develop leadership, problem-solving skills, inter and intrapersonal <clears throat> uh, competencies, uh, systems thinking and analysis, and cross-cultural cross -cultural competencies. We, we've had very good engagement from my perspective in terms of the students that have been in the program. We've had uh, anywhere from 150 to 200 students taking courses that are uh, part of the, the GELM suite of, of optional courses uh, each year. So that's uh, quite a number of students that are, are moving through this, this suite of courses. We also have about 20 to 30 students who are formally uh, enrolled in the, the minor program itself and about 10 students graduate with the minor designation each year. And so uh, I think uh, that really speaks well to the, the um, vibrancy and the sustainability of, of the program. Uh, we also have been really fortunate in the program to have some dedicated funding to, to support students that are, are participating and especially around the, the travel um, piece. Uh, and so there's uh, dedicated endowments, um, the largest of which is the Monday uh, travel endowment um, uh, that uh, many students are able to use to, to support their travel either in a course or, or separate from that. And the College of Engineering has been very uh, supportive as, as the Leadership and Education Development Office. So thank you to all those uh, sources for the financial um, support. Uh, one example course is uh, Kerry Watkins course, which is Sustainable Transportation Abroad. You can see uh, some of the highlights here. Uh, this course has taken a couple different uh, formats. Uh, most recently, uh, Kerry has been leading uh, students in a study of, uh, abroad over spring break, uh, where they're in uh, an instructional setting in Atlanta for most of the semester, but have this uh, trip to the Netherlands where they learn about uh, multimodal transportation and sustainable uh, practices uh, on the ground in the Netherlands. And you can see the, the group here is having a really nice time uh, during their studies. And I also just wanted to highlight the, the Hyatt uh, Distinguished uh, Leadership uh, Speaker Series. Uh, this has really been a, a great success in the school. Um, it uh, is required for the students in the GELM program, but is open to all students. And, uh, each, each semester we have uh, really great uh, participation. You can see a few of the speakers um, uh, shown here on the slide. Uh, Wayne Clough was our inaugural speaker back in 2015, and uh, the most recent speaker was uh, Stacy Sire, who, who spoke in September of this year. And uh, our old friend Reggie DeRoche uh, will be our speaker um, in the spring semester. And, um, I, off the top of my head, forgot the date of that, but I'm sure someone else uh, will remember and, and chime in with that information. Uh, but look for an announcement that uh, for the Hyatt uh, Spring uh, Lecture, and as I said, Reggie will be uh, returning to Georgia Tech to deliver that address. Um, and this has been a really great opportunity for some of our highly successful alums uh, and, and other people that have been affiliated with the with the school to come and talk about their leadership experience and, um, and really give the students some words of wisdom about uh, how to uh, move forward with their career and the aspirations uh, that they can have. So I will stop there and uh, turn it over to Eve to, to make a few uh, remarks of his own. Oh, th <clears throat> thank you, uh, Don, and, and, and uh, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, despite the challenges of COVID. Uh, I really want to thank the, the organizers here, Chloe in particular, Adjo and Don and, and, and others. Uh, I, I, it's really a privilege for me, uh, you know, as the Vice Provost for International Initiatives to be working with colleagues all across campus when I see the level of engagement that, that is really pervasive among not just the students, but the faculty, the staff. And this is particularly true in civil and environmental engineering. Very impressive sets of programs uh, for globally en engaged students. And as you saw uh, uh, just a, a couple of days ago, the new president, uh, not so new, Dr. Cabrera released uh, our final version of the strategic plan. And clearly we want to be, we, we are and want to be a, a globally focused uh, uh, institution and, and having a school like civil and environmental engineering really uh, energizing programs with uh, this this wonderful minor, the, the global engineering leadership minor is, is really a privilege for, for me to sit back and watch all the good things happening 
Um, I know firsthand, you know, the impact that such programs can have on, on students. Uh, I was a student a long time ago, and I can tell you that my own journey, uh, uh, professional and personal journey, was really tremendously affected by global engagement opportunities and leadership opportunities. And when I see such a program, I think it, it really excites me to see that this is really what keeps me uh, uh, going to work in the morning to see the impact that we have on students is really, really heartwarming. So congratulations on putting a, a great uh, webinar. I, I'm very impressed by what I see, the panelists, the discussions, the students. Um, again, thank you all for all you do for Georgia Tech, for the students. And I look forward to hearing more about it. Uh, uh, I'll stay tuned. And um, uh, again, thank you. And back to you, Chloe. Merci beaucoup, Yves. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bertolo. Um, we'll now take a closer look to the leadership training offered in the GELM. In the following panel, three GELM instructors will talk about the leadership course components, the communication skill set that goes with it, as well as the integration between leadership and engineering. So again, if you have any question during the panel, feel free to post it in the chat and we will address the questions after the panels are done speaking. I already see some chat communications here. Uh, Adjo put the, the date of the next Hyatt lecture. So we have Dr. Rudy Bonaparte, who is the chairman and the senior principal at Geosyntec Consultants, which is a global leading geotechnical company where he previously served as president and CEO for 20 years. Um, Dr. Rudy Bonaparte was appointed professor of the practice at Georgia Tech in 2016. Dr. Lisa Rosenstein holds a PhD in English from Emory University. She created and directs the Charles Gearing Program in Engineering Communication and she is recording is on in teaching communication and leadership components of the GEM. She participated in the CE London course created by Dr. Lawrence Stewart. And Dr. Robert Simon holds a PhD in educational leadership and he serves as an academic professional in the School of CEE. Before that, he served as a graduate academic advisor, a role for which he got an award for excellent service and leadership in 2016. He teaches in the GEM as well. So without further ado, uh, panelists, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Chloe. And I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, do, you, do you see the presentation? Yes, we can yes, see the presentation. See the slide deck, Great. too. Ah, uh, I need to switch. There we go. Swap presenter. H how was that? That's good. Good. So uh, I'm just going to kick off our, our panel with a few slides uh, discussing um, leadership training through our class, uh, Global Engineering Leadership. And this is something that Lisa and I have put together. Uh, the course theme that we stressed throughout the course is ambitious and altruistic. Speaking to the students, we say, over the time frame of your working careers, engineers will be called on to lead multidisciplinary, multicultural teams to tackle the national and global challenges we'll discuss throughout the class. You can become one of these engineering leaders and in so doing have an exciting and fulfilling career while helping to make the world a better place. So that is the theme of CEE 4000. We have three sets of learning objectives. The first, building personal leadership attributes. And so we focus on developing written and oral communication skills. And Lisa will talk about that. We focus on developing skills in team building, collaboration, and team leadership. We focus on skills in developing and understanding cross-culturalism in a professional context and specifically in an engineering context. And finally, we focus on developing knowledge of engineering ethics and ethical behavior and what's expected of leaders in this regard. The second uh, 
course learning objective uh, centers around building an engineering organization, talking about the way the engineering world works and the career progression of a young professional in their career. We mostly focus on private civil engineering and consulting firms. The reason for that is twofold. One, it's what I know best. And secondly, we know that about two thirds of Georgia Tech civil and environmental engineering graduates will be going into that type of career path. But we also address other career paths, including government, construction, academic, institutional, and non-governmental organizations. In this context, we try to help the students understand and develop aptitude with respect to the market, financial, human, organizational, political, cultural, and competitive factors that go into creating and building an engineering organization. Uh, the third uh, set of learning objectives uh, relate to uh, becoming a global engineering leader, and it has a global focus. So we look, work towards developing an understanding of global engineering grand challenges, both the NAE grand challenges and others, and the role that CEs can play in addressing these. We work towards developing capability in the students to evaluate, understand, and relate to people in different cultures. We try to help the students understand the framework for effective cross-cultural relationships. And the backbone for doing that is the book, The Culture Map by Aaron Meyer. And uh, we have a specific activity to help the student build these, school, these skills and that is evaluating the viability of a CEE organization in an international city in terms of opportunities, markets, business and legal factors, cultural and social factors, and risk factors. And this is a major team project, as we'll see in two slides. To wrap up my initial comments, this is one of two slides showing the syllabus for the course. Highlighted in yellow are the core lectures that we have throughout the class. In green, student assignments. Here you see a grand challenges essay and a strategic plan analysis. The students actually need to analyze the strategic plan of an organization. And then in blue, the major team assignments. The first assignment shown on this slide uh, uh, involves developing a business plan for a domestic engineering and consulting company, a real company, a real business plan. And that's presented to us in uh, midterm presentation by the team. So it's a team presentation. Uh, this is the second half of the, the uh, syllabus, and I'll just point out the two team activities. One is a team presentation on an en engineering ethics case study. And the second is a major team project, the major team project that involves international expansion. We asked the students to take their business plan for their domestic company and evaluate the viability of taking that business to an international location and then making a go, no go recommendation to the board of directors, which is Lisa and I, uh, on whether we should expand internationally. And this involves both the team presentation and a final team report. So with that, I'll stop and uh, turn the floor over next to Dr. Rosenstein. Thank you, and I will go out of the presentation mode and give, there we go. All right, thank you, Rudy. Hi, everyone. I'm, I know most of the people on this call, uh, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lisa Rosenstein, and I, I created and run the Engineering Communications Program for Civil Engineering. Effective communication is one of the central competencies of the engineer leader, uh, and accordingly, communications instruction is integrated into the JELM courses. In fact, some of the courses specifically identify communication skills as the leadership attribute stressed in the course. So you just heard about CE 4000, uh, and because I am an instructor of record, a co-instructor of record for that course, um, 
it is highly communications intensive and in how communications intensive you ask you saw you saw the assignments Rudy um, just presented that those assignments oral and written account for 95 percent of the grade um, if you care to hear more about the breakdown of that I can show you I can talk about that in the Q&A um, but there are no homeworks there are no quizzes there are no tests it's all about communicating the engineering content in written form or an oral form. But beyond CE 4000, I guess lecture in many, if not most, of the other GELM courses. Uh, I create unique customized lectures or workshops, sometimes assignments uh, for the other courses, and I can give you two uh, very different examples. So the first example would be uh, in the course, the Envi Environmental Technology in the Developing World. In this course, the student's final project requires them to present their quantitative data, their research uh, results, to, non -technical, to a non-technical audience, to governmental uh, and, and political entities. So I was asked to come in and create a customized lecture for the students that combined both non-technical communication skills and data display. So it was not enough uh, to, for the students just to know data display, which, which we teach them in, in CE 3000, but how do you display data for a non-technical audience? What works for them? What kinds of, what kinds of displays are appropriate for a non-technical audience? So that was a very customized lecture for that specific course. Another example, very different, uh, is CE London which was mentioned earlier, uh, Lauren and I take a, a group of students, who are structural engineering students, over to London. Uh, and the, you know, the constraints of being in another country and not being in a conventional classroom and the opportunities of being in what we like to call the living laboratory uh, of the world allowed us to completely expand the types of communication skills we teach the students. So in terms of writing, they're not writing regular reports or standard engineering reports or papers. Uh, they, we have them write an engineering blog uh, in, which, in the form in which they can uh, demonstrate their competencies in structural engineering. So for those of you who are thinking, oh, blog, they're just writing, you know, oh, this was cool. It was a highly rigorous uh, document that they could uh, comment on each other's works. And, and you end up with this beautiful artifact at the end of the semester uh, with photographs and comments and, and again, high quality engineering uh, content. And for the oral communication, Lauren and I were very clear that we were not traveling across the ocean to do standard PowerPoint presentations that we could have done in any Atlanta classroom. Uh, and so we expanded the skill set to include oral presentations out uh, in the open. Uh, the students were giving tours, uh, tours of historic structures out on the streets, on the bridges that they were discussing, with traffic going by, with tourists stopping and, and listening. Um, and it, in, it required the students to really expand their ability to speak in public, really public, um, and to come up with creative ways to give their audience information. They, they asked us to download information onto our phones. They brought iPads with them. So it was, it was very creative, very useful, and gave them the skill set to perhaps lead lab tours uh, uh, in, in the future. So as you can see, communication is, is highly uh, central to the GELM courses, and for the students who are on the, on the call who are interested in, in either taking the courses or uh, enrolling in the minor, you can look forward to developing uh, your competencies in this skill set. So thank you, and I would like to turn it over to Robert now. Thank you, Dr. Rosenstein. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I, I think, like, like Dr. Rosenstein said, I, I know most of the people on this call, for, but for those who don't, um, my name is Robert Simon. I'm an academic professional here in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, my background is in organizational leadership. My interests are in organizational behavior, team performance, and, and innovation. Uh, very happy to be here and just wanted to add a, a few words on top of what Dr. Bonaparte and Dr. Rosenstein shared as it relates to leadership training in the a uh, significant motivation behind the GELM is the development of performance skills on top of the technical skills students learn in our curriculum. DE has a long history with this, uh, as shown in Dr. Rosenstein's communication program, the Home, the Budding Entrepreneurship program, as well as a number of ad hoc workshops and, and seminars. 
Our goal in developing engineer leaders is to produce graduates that possess superior technical and performance skills, both of which are critical to their success as a practicing engineer and essential to them becoming a leader. Beyond the Cornerstone 4000 course, which, as Dr. Bonaparte showed, is really more of a comprehensive overview of leadership in an engineering context, uh, we've approached some of the other courses in a different way. We've designed several modules, kind of like Dr. Rosenstein was saying, that we embed into existing job courses. This allows the existing course to continue to focus on the technical side, developing those engineering problem-solving skills and conceptual skills, while also forming, folding in performance modules that help students develop their knowledge and application of leadership principles and interpersonal skills. More specifically, our modules include team effectiveness, conflict management, communication, like Dr. Rosenstein mentioned. And in each one, we modify the module to fit with the existing course. For example, in courses where there are team projects, such as origami engineering this, this fall semester, we introduced a team formation and effectiveness workshop early in the semester as students begin working on their project and forming teams. And then later in the semester, we'll return with modules on communications, and conflict management, which are more appropriately timed for students once they've engaged in their project for them. Each module, we bring in leadership theories and constructs that provide a leadership lens to the students' work. Additionally, we, we've seen that it really helps students to be able to learn these skills in the right applied context. Our embedded module approach allows us to customize topically our workshops, and it really helps when students can immediately turn around and apply those skills in the same course. Most of our workshops, even the virtual ones these days, uh, we try to have in-class activities centered around the work the teams are currently doing. Regardless of a student's career path, they will almost certainly work on teams, and they will work with people. Even lighthouse keepers interact with others occasionally. Collaboration in general has increased greatly over the past two decades. And one's ability to communicate, collaborate, understand varying perspectives, manage various types of conflict, and be an authentic contributor to their teams and their organizations will have a significant impact on their career. Furthermore, many of the requirements for team effectiveness, for example, listening, authenticity, building trust, creating meaning, among others, are also characteristics of effective leadership. Developing these traits is the purpose of the gel. So for those students in the audience today uh, interested in developing those skills alongside your undergraduate program, I would strongly encourage you to consider the GELM and its courses. Thank you. Thanks uh, to all of our three panelists. Ashley is telling me that we have a few questions in the chat box. So Ashley, would you like to read them aloud and, and see how our panelists can address them? Um, we actually don't have any questions yet in the chat box, but I would encourage any students who, who do have questions to please enter a question in the chat um, and we can answer them now or our panelists will continue to answer them as we move forward with the webinar. All right. Let me pause for one minute uh, and see if we have any questions before we move on to the next panel. While we're pausing, uh, I'm going to introduce myself, which I realize I totally forgot to do. Uh, my name is Chloe Arson. I'm a, an associate professor in geosystems in the school, and I'm chairing the Committee for International Initiatives. All right, I'm not hearing any question, and I don't see any question in the chat box. So uh, let's move on to the next panel. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has raised unique challenges in the way we interact with the world and in the way we learn. In the next panel, GELM instructors will explain to us how they adapted their pedagogic approach to these extraordinary circumstances. And again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to use the chat box. We have Dr. Babak Mishui, who is a professor in construction and infrastructure systems engineering, uh, who is an expert in construction analytics and economics. In the GELM, he teaches a course on mega projects. Dr. Glaucio Paulino is a professor in structural engineering, mechanics and materials with expertise in structural reliability, topology optimization, finite element simulation, and adaptive meshing. In the GELM, he teaches origami engineering. 
Dr. Lauren Stewart is an associate professor in CEE with expertise in dynamic testing, structural design for extreme events, and structural analysis in case of BLAST. She created the CE London program. In the GELM, she teaches Introduction to Structural Engineering for GELM and Historic Structures. Dr. Kerry Watkins is an associate professor in Transportation Systems Engineering with expertise in street design, mode choice decision making, and transit planning. In the GELM, she teaches a course entitled Sustainable Transportation Abroad. Welcome to our four panelists. Without further ado, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chloe. I think I'm I'm the first on the list, yeah? All right. Correct. Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. I'm Bob or Shuri. I have a joint appointment with environmental and building construction. Uh, my area of research is quantitative methods, uh, innovative project delivery. And for GELM, I'm teaching two classes and when this whole COVID things happened, we were in the middle of the, the two courses. The first one was 4150, construction management and mega project. And the second one is the one that I developed with uh, Mr. Michael Mesner. Yeah, we were in the middle of the, the two classes, particularly construction management and mega projects. We try to have at least uh, two or three site visits to major projects that going on in Atlanta area. And uh, unfortunately, if you guys as remember uh, that Friday uh, that the, we were scheduled to visit Atlanta for two major projects. And uh, unfortunately, we had to go on, on online and sort of, you know, the, the rest of the semester we were not. The, the projects we were supposed to visit, you know, I'm speaking of the airport, I think some of us used to be there uh, all the time, but now uh, it's far distance in the past. Uh, we were supposed to see the McCarthy projects. There was recently finished uh, LED canopies that if you uh, remember, that's now a sort of a gateway to the project. And also they had several parking structure projects that we were supposed to see and the whole Aeropolis kind of, you know, planning. Uh, so it was a three hour great um, visit that unfortunately we had to, to cancel that. The way we came up with an alternative was through a virtual presentation. I think we quickly respond to that. Um, there was another visit was a schedule for uh, seeing some of the major transit projects to, with the MARTA, some of their, some of the projects and the uh, station develop uh, renovation projects, some of the rehabilitation of the existing tracks. So that one went virtual as well. Uh, speaking of that class and the experience and sort of, you know, moving forward with that, uh, I think, so what I was trying to say, we, we will be able to do more of a virtual sessions because the industry cope with the new as far as the virtual design and construction for partnering sessions, for uh, collaborative design development, as well as, you know, even construction walkthrough in the job site and inspection and all of those other things. So uh, one of the challenges for, was for the student group to uh, finish their projects, so that was, you know, an integrated part of their uh, their work, and that was, was a challenge. And I think the students overall did a good job finally. But certainly, the experience would have been better had, if we could have more person-to-person uh, -person interaction. The other class, as far as the 4803 uh, with Mr. Messner, uh, the issue was different, because in, inviting several other people. I quite beneficial because we were able to get some people from uh, other sites, other parts of United States to participate and tell us about their public-private partnership experience, uh, tell us about uh, experience related to the infrastructure, finan financial standpoint, legal standpoint, and organizational structure. Uh, I remember our last speaker was uh, 
uh, with, uh, flew down from Philadelphia, from Liberty Mutual, talking to the students of the construction uh, surety industry and the state of the insurance in the market. Uh, we had rigorous discussion because the COVID was on the horizon. And I clearly remember there were concerns as far as being in a big insurance company. Uh, there were concerns about that. And I'm, I'm glad at least as one of the last presentation, they were able to see uh, what even a little bit uncertainty means for the, for the market. Anyhow, um, um, but I think moving forward, uh, as the industry evolves, more virtual design and construction, so we can have, uh, we can accommodate that. I think we are more resilient now to accommodate the changes. And uh, yeah, we, we learned on both classes that we need to, uh, I mean, the students also are tasked for a great challenge of working together in a virtual team, make that virtual teaming. I think the gem, you know, one of the things we can emphasize on that moving forward, in, in my humble opinion, is to help them in a virtual team. Like if, if you really don't know the other person working uh, somewhere else around the world, how you can have effective communication uh, established and move forward. Um, again, that's all about, uh, sorry if I had some kind of issues at home, but you know, I'll be happy to in any questions. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Babak. So we'll turn the floor to Glacio. Okay, thanks, Chloe. I will uh, share the screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Excellent. Uh, thank you. I am uh, very glad to participate uh, in the GELM uh, meeting today. And uh, in this part of uh, the section here, we are supposed to uh, share our uh, experience uh, during the COVID. And uh, I'll tell you my personal uh, perspective on this, especially what we have been doing uh, during the semester. Uh, I will concentrate in this class that we are teaching, uh, the origami engineering, that is part of uh, the GELM, and uh, is one of the classes that uh, Don Webster showed in the beginning of uh, his presentation. And uh, uh, this class uh, has a final project, and uh, here you can see, uh, if you can see the pointer, uh, you can see one of the teams uh, that work on the project. For example, here you can see Atia, Tegan, and Olivia from left to right. Uh, Tia is at the left, then uh, Tegan, then Olivia at the right-hand side. And uh, they took the class last year, and uh, what uh, they noticed is that uh, when you plant uh, a plant uh, and you put it in a container or in a vase, then uh, the plant grows, but the container doesn't. And then uh, they had an idea to do a, a container that would grow with the plant. In the beginning, I did not like uh, the idea very much, but then they proved me wrong and uh, they did. Uh, they were very happy about that, by the way. And uh, they did a fantastic project and uh, now they are uh, trying to improve it and uh, do a patent and uh, commercialize the idea. They continue to work on the project. So the, so the, the project uh, is a, uh, is a major component of the class, and I will elaborate a little bit more on it. This is our youngest uh, student in the class, Evans, and uh, he worked on a, did a project on a origami-inspired uh, collapsible uh, shipping containers. His idea is that the shipping containers that you see, they are so huge, they occupy space, and a lot of the times they are not used. Then uh, he developed a technique uh, to fold uh, and flatten and uh, reduce the space that uh, those containers uh, take when they are not utilized. And uh, the class, uh, I think, relates very much to the first word of, of uh, GEM, uh, global, in the sense that uh, it has uh, tremendous diversity, including intellectual diversity. For example, last year we had uh, 42 students from five colleges. And uh, here is the breakdown of uh, all the students uh, and uh, all the colleges. We had the students from College of Engineering, College of Design, College of Computing, College of Science, and the College of uh, Liberal Arts. And um, 
the uh, in uh, this class, we try to capitalize on uh, this uh, diversity. And uh, as I indicated, uh, we have a project. And uh, in general, we require that uh, the students be from uh, diverse background, uh, uh, different uh, departments, uh, different interests, different knowledge, uh, and so on. And uh, we need help to do that. And I am uh, very grateful to Robert. Uh, he helped us uh, this time uh, to help the students to assemble their teams uh, in the right way, uh, how to manage the team, the health of the team. This is a lecture that uh, he gave on uh, October 8. And uh, I really appreciate the wonderful uh, work that he did because uh, during the pandemic, for example, this year we have uh, less students than last year and uh, the interaction uh, is uh, among the students uh, the faculty the tas the team is always a challenge because uh, of the covid and uh, robert did a wonderful job uh, to help them uh, to interact in a very effective way uh, even uh, when they are uh, online or when they cannot meet uh, physically and uh, this was very, very helpful. And uh, we are going to have uh, uh, the final project presentation uh, early in uh, December. Another aspect of the class is the international component. Uh, in a previous year, we took the students to Japan. And uh, that was uh, a great experience uh, from many different points of view. And uh, Japan is the birthplace of origami. And uh, the students uh, really had a terrific experience. And this will connect with uh, the committee that is led by Chloe on uh, the international activities and uh, one of the sessions that uh, we are going to have in a few minutes. And uh, finally, uh, because the COVID is so challenging, what we try to do in the class uh, is to communicate in a way that uh, we can really reach the students. And then uh, we had uh, a Twitter and uh, an Instagram account. And uh, then anything interesting that happens in the class, we immediately publish there and the students respond, interact. And uh, that is a way that uh, we found was very effective to keep in touch with the students and uh, really communicate with them. And at the same time, uh, they communicate in the way that they like. But uh, any time they are communicating, they are learning new ideas, new concepts and uh, keeping up to date with everything that is happening in the class. So finally, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, there was a, a student uh, in the class that uh, wrote uh, a book about the class. I had no participation on that and wrote, uh, did a very nice book, very well illustrated on the class, The Art of the Future. And uh, this is available on the website. If you are uh, interested, you can uh, search some of these keywords and uh, you can find it there. So I am uh, looking forward uh, to the next uh, semester. Finally, one comment I would like to make is that uh, uh, in the beginning uh, of uh, this semester, when uh, we had to teach in the hybrid mode, then uh, I, I was uh, very tense teaching uh, the in-person class. And uh, the students also were very tense in the beginning. We didn't know very much what to do, how to act. But everybody was extremely cooperative. And that is wonderful. The students are wonderful. And uh, they were very, very helpful. And uh, then uh, as time went by, then uh, we learn uh, better how, how to be in the environment, uh, how to observe the social distance, uh, how to protect each other, how to communicate in, in ways that we are safe and everybody around us are safe. And uh, now towards the end of uh, the course, I feel that uh, we feel much more comfortable and uh, that was a learning experience uh, for everybody. I learned a lot. The TAs learn a lot and the students learn a lot. And then uh, we understood each other as the semester went. As I said in the beginning, all of us were looking at each other in very strange ways. But uh, at the end uh, and now, for example, we feel very comfortable with each other and we know how to interact and uh, the class is going quite well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glacio. Uh, let's hear uh, uh, Lauren Stewart's words of wisdom. Thanks, Colby. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Stewart, and I run the CE London program. 
Um, and I think the good news for CE London is that we're still hopeful that we'll get to travel in the summer. So the program this year will look a little bit different than it has in previous years. And all the changes that are made um, are geared toward giving us the best fighting chance to actually get to travel this summer. So um, the, the main difference that you'll see coming up for CE London is that in previous years, we traveled in May at the beginning of summer. This year, so this coming summer, we're planning on offering um, introduction to structures in the late summer session this time with travel in August. So we're hoping that pushing out the travel until August will give us a good fighting chance to actually be able to travel with students. So I know a lot of students are have been emailing me asking me if we're going to be traveling. Um, we're hopeful that we will, um, and that's the main change that you'll see. Um, and because of that traveling in August, another difference is that we will be doing the class kind of in a more standard Atlanta-based class, and then the entire trip portion will be after. So a bit of a change, a bit of a structural change. It, that change also allows us to be a bit more flexible if all of a sudden we can't travel, that because it's at the end, hopefully it won't affect as much. So you'll see a lot of differences um, just from the structure and the logistics portion, but know that they were all put in place to give us the best chance of actually traveling this summer. Um, so some of the things that you can expect on um, on the, the trip portion, um, we're planning on doing most of the same activities that we did before, um, just in a more condensed fashion at the end. Um, we're planning on still going to St. Paul's Cathedral to reinforce our learning on domes. Um, we're planning on still going to Scotland to go to the Firth of Forth and look at the do a boat tour that looks at the three bridges, the suspension, the truss, and the cable stay. Um, plan on looking at the skyscrapers around London and talking about load paths and wind loading. Um, and then we plan on still integrating all of the same cultural activities, the, the theater, which I know is Lisa's favorite. Um, occasionally we take students to sporting events. So depending on how COVID plans out, we'll pick and choose what cultural activities, but you should expect the same, the same activities and the same reinforcement of the technical concepts, just in a slightly more condensed fashion at the end. Um, and so the, we, we applied for a final institute approval to get this going, and I would expect that in the next, probably about a month, you'll start to see um, more marketing towards how you should apply once we get all the final approvals. Um, and you can reach out or ask in the chat any more questions, but again, um, fingers crossed that hopefully the impact on the next CE London will be minor and that we'll still get to, to travel. Um, so please let me know if you have any questions. I think I just got a question about applications. So yeah, so we can't accept appli applications until the Institute approves it. So you should in the next month or so start seeing marketing towards when um, we're gonna start taking applications. Um, but I can't confirm anything until we get the final sign off, but that's the plan. Thank you, Lauren. So now we will turn the floor to Carrie. Thank you, I'm gonna go ahead. Oh my goodness. Okay, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen. All right, can you see that okay? Okay, so uh, my name is Carrie Watkins. Um, I am the person who teaches 4660 Sustainable Transport Abroad, which um, Dr. Webster already brought up. So this has been a class that's been taught a number of times already. Um, and the topic that we've used in the past is the Netherlands, and we've focused on their cycling and to a certain extent their transit and train infrastructure, but a large focus on cycling infrastructure there as an example of how different cultures um, have really changed their transportation system from the model that we use here in the US. Um, the course is taught in the spring. Uh, fortunately for me, it's taught on alternate years. And so I was not faced with um, some of the chaos and other things that occurred this past spring as COVID was first hitting us. 
Um, and I was also fortunate in that I uh, got some early wind about what was going to happen with spring break, which is this is an embedded study abroad course. So we typically um, are on campus uh, doing all of our prep work and doing all, all our design work after the trip, but we use spring break to travel. Um, and I knew that regardless of what happens with COVID in the spring, we weren't going to have a spring break. Uh, which meant that I immediately pivoted to how do we do this class well at Georgia Tech. So that's what I'm going to talk about right now is not sort of lessons learned, but how I'm pivoting to make um, a JELM study abroad course still available on campus this coming spring, despite the lack of travel. Um, so let me advance. So what 4660 is about sustainable transport abroad, we look at the planning, the design, the operations of transportation systems. Um, we do this in countries known abroad for more sustainable multimodal approaches. And our focus thus far has been on the Netherlands. The reason um, is that cycling and transit usage in the Netherlands is much, much higher than pretty much any other country. Uh, in the world, um, and it's prevalent among all ages, all levels of comfort with cycling. The reason that they do this is it's very important to the Dutch um, that they have a denser environment, that they have low emissions and noise, that they have positive health impacts, and this is a way to design your transportation system to achieve those things. Um, they have a 26% bicycle mode share nationwide. In some cities, it's as high as 40%. Um, and 67% or 69% of commuters use their bike at least sometimes. So it's pretty prevalent among the community. When we do this, um, the way that we approach this is we conduct a site visit every day when we're in the Netherlands, um, and we meet with transportation professionals there. And so we'll have a meeting with somebody in the morning, typically, and then we'll go out and we'll go on a bike ride or we'll ride trains all day. And as we're doing this during our week abroad, we're constantly talking about how they design for bikes, how they integrate bikes in transit, um, what suburban design looks like, because this is even sometimes lower density like we have in the US, and they're still applying these same techniques. Um, how they approach network design, what transit looks like, high quality transit, and we do this throughout different places in the country. So we will ride trains um, with our bikes, or we will ride our bikes, or um, we will simply just take a train and then take transit around a city and we will assess all of these things as we're doing so. So we have a home base, but every day in a different place um, is, is kind of the motto. So it's a fast paced spring break uh, where we're seeing tons of stuff and we are barely ever in a classroom. When we are in a classroom, it's at the Delft University of Technology. So we base ourselves in Delft and this is their civil engineering building. Uh, you can see how most of their students get to campus when you look at their, their parking lot out front. But then, like I said, our classroom is typically also city hall chambers where a professional will meet with us and talk about how they have approached um, design to their transportation infrastructure. It'll be in train stations where somebody gives us a tour. It'll be on the streets of Amsterdam, The Hague, and Delft um, as we're biking around and with professionals and having them tell us about the infrastructure and how it was created and what the impact has been. A big part of the program is that we take um, a couple of professionals with us. Um, in the past, this has been um, all kinds of folks from the Georgia DOT to the city of Atlanta. Uh, Beltline folks, um, folks from outside of Atlanta, people who are mid to high level professionals, um, and they, you know, speak to the students as we're traveling from place to place. The students get to see their reactions to the infrastructure as well. Um, and so there's a lot of these informal interactions and informal mentoring opportunities. Um, and then our leadership competencies, how this fits well into the JELM is um, cultural awareness and global competencies. So we look at how cyclists are prioritized, how cycling is perceived, 
how their culture has influenced design and vice versa. And then we learn feedback. So we do an actual design project where these concepts are applied and the students learn how to give each other constructive feedback on um, those designs. And then this informal mentoring that I talked about, sort of how do you find mentors? How do you develop relationships with mentors? How do you work with a mentor to get appropriate career advice? Things like that. So now enter COVID. <laughs> a lot of the fun things that we do in this course um, are in prep for and then during our visit and then uh, sort of wrapping up after we get back. And so uh, what has to go because of COVID? Um, well, in a spring course, uh, travel has to go. So, so we're losing travel to the Netherlands. Um, but I decided to take a positive um, turn on this and think about, well, what can stay? Um, and just about everything else can. We can still have this sustainable transportation practices um, focus. Uh, we can still learn from professionals abroad. We're, we're fortunate in that a lot of the professionals we meet with over there were perfectly willing uh, to get on Zoom calls, Blue Jeans calls um, with us and still do their lectures and still chat with us. Uh, you may not be sitting in City Hall in The Hague. Um, instead, you're sitting in your bedroom, um, but you still get to interact with the professionals. And we can still do the mentoring from the professionals in the US. If anything, it's easier because they don't have to commit to this entire week. They lose out on the experience, but it's much easier to involve a lot of different people in that aspect of the course. Which brings us to what do we gain? Um, by not having the travel to the Netherlands, we can actually use more than one international example instead of just one. Um, we're we're going to get to travel to lots of places, even if it's virtually. Uh, we still get to see the example of lots of places. And our guest speakers have a lot more flexibility because there's a whole semester. There's a lot less time constraints over everyone focused on this one week. And we have all of our Tuesdays and Thursdays um, at 8 in the morning in order to involve people. So. In addition, um, we've been doing some thought um, among my teaching team of how we can bring some aspects into it so that um, the students can still experience the, the trip abroad and not just hear about it, but try to feel it as much as possible. And so we've been doing all kinds of homework and trying to find videos fortunate for us there is an individual in the Netherlands um, who runs a website called Bicycle Dutch, um, and he has made all kinds of um, GoPro videos of the rides that he's taken. In the past, we've done our own GoPro rides of um, GoPro videos of rides that we've taken, and we intend to use a lot of this so that the students can still try to get an experience. Um, we've even joked about the fact that maybe they should get their own uh, bike set up going with their video screen in front of them so they can just pretend that they're riding right through the country as uh, they're learning all of this. Um, and as you can see, you still get a flare. Well, let's see if it gets there. You can still get a flare for being um, in the Netherlands. If we watch this video long enough, you'll see windmills. Here we go. Windmills off to the side. So we can look at infrastructure, but we can even see beautiful Dutch countryside. Even if we can't be there one day, hopefully they were all good to go. In addition, though, like I said, we don't just get the example of the Netherlands. Um, the constraint you have when you only get a week is it's really hard to go to more than one country. Um, but when we have a whole semester, we get to bring in the Netherlands one week and then Japan the next. So this is a video that I myself took um, on a different study abroad trip when we traveled to Japan. And so we can show videos from all kinds of places. We can pull in things that lots of different people have done. So what we're going to do in spring 2021, um, we are a Tuesday, Thursday, 8 a.m. class. Um, because of our guest speakers, it was the best time frame in order to bring uh, from the countries that we really wanted to focus on um, in Asia and Europe, 
this was the easiest time frame to bring those folks into the classroom. So we're bright and early at 8 a.m. Um, we're going to have synchronous instructor-led lectures and discussions, synchronous guest lectures, and then small group online discussions. Um, I have found during my COVID teaching that um, synchronous is great, but students don't really interact well. So instead, we've flipped to turning at least half of our lectures into pre-recorded videos and videos from other folks, and instead using our class time to do small group discussions. So dividing the class into several smaller groups where we interact with them and talk about the stuff that they've they've watched. Um, and where it's not, you know, a bunch of students all at the same time, where it's a smaller group of less than 10, so that there's actually more interaction and everyone feels more comfortable talking. Um, in addition to this, outside of class, they will watch some of these pre-recorded videos so that we can use our time better in class for these small group discussions. Um, they'll meet with their mentors. They'll do cultural and design assignments. And then they're going to have a, pro a final project, which is going to be a little bit different. They're going to pick a country that they want to look into more deeply so that my um, my grad students, my PhD students, who are all serving as TAs for this class, and myself can actually learn about other places. Um, where might we want to go in the future other than the Netherlands and Japan, which is where I've been teaching uh, to date? And so we may use the examples we're familiar with, but we're hoping that the students are going to teach us about how transportation is sustainable in other places as well. And then we're going to have some optional outdoor field trips, like rides around Atlanta and things like that. So I'm trying to figure out how I unshare. <laughs> um, Thank so, you, Carrie. So that yeah. is how we're going to do a sustainable transportation abroad uh, this spring. And I'm happy to take questions along with the others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, I think you do have a question. Uh, Nicolas Stokes is asking, will there be a planned Netherlands trip in spring of 2022? Yes. Um, so in spring of 2022, we're going, assuming that COVID world is over, um, which personally, I like all the, the talk about vaccines. So hopefully by spring of 2022, we're going to be in a better place. And the plan for spring of 2022 is to definitely be in the Netherlands. Um, and we may actually do the Netherlands and Denmark if I can figure out how to squeeze them both into a week. Wonderful. Thank you. I uh, do not see any more questions in the chat box, but you still have a few seconds to do so. I see that uh, we are a little bit tight in schedule. so. Perhaps, uh, Emily, you can launch the intermission video, and if questions come up after the intermission, we can take them then. Emily, are you here? Okay, here it is. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Pop, and I've been part of the Global Engineering Leadership Minor since fall 2017. I'm so excited to be here today to share some of my experiences in the minor with you. Currently, I'm a fifth year civil engineering student about to wrap up my undergraduate degree in just a few short weeks. I'll actually be staying on campus to pursue a master's in civil engineering department in transportation systems engineering. The fact that I chose to pursue a master's and in the specific track that I chose was hugely influenced by my global experiences in the minor. So why did I first join the minor? Um, Initially, I chose to join the minor because of a combination of interests. I've always been infatuated by the idea of eventually working and living in a new country, and I really felt that integrating an internship or a global experience into my undergraduate career would really give me that trial run of what that would be like once I start my career. And also, I absolutely love traveling, pursuing new adventures. So with the amount of support from the College of Engineering, not just in terms of the courses for the minor, but also financial support, I really felt like my dream of becoming a globetrotter would truly be possible. And uh, in terms of some of my favorite experiences that hopefully will convince you to also join the minor, I could really go on and on about some of the incredible experiences I've had in the minor, not just the travel components, but also many of the Atlanta-based courses as well. Um, I do have to say that my capstone experience, experiences traveling 
and living as an exchange student in Southeast Asia at the National University of Singapore was, to put it frankly, life-changing. Not only was I able to travel on weekends to new places to experience the rich cultures and stark differences in cultures across that specific region, but I had the chance to take some classes that were totally enlightening and truly enhanced my thinking, not just about Asia, but about my own home country, the United States. So um, while I was in Singapore, I decided to go out on a limb and take a Tamil language class which um, Tamil is one of the national languages in Singapore and commonly spoken in South India. So you don't hear it that much around Atlanta, but I was really excited to take this course. Um, but the class was only eight people. It was me and seven Singaporean locals. So we really came to become close friends. And as one of the first American classmates and colleagues that these friends had encountered, we often asked each other questions and shared personal experiences. So. That's where I really got to learn not just about Singaporean culture from an outside perspective, but also an insider perspective. And we often took field trips as a class to Little India and shared some huge plates of biryani rice together. So um, although it's hard to stay in touch with those friends on the other side of the world, that memory of that class and that friendship will always, always stick with me. And this story kind of ties into valuable things that I learned throughout some of my experiences. Besides the exchange program, I was able to travel to China and Japan to learn more about rebuilding from disasters over spring break with Dr. Frost class. And on top of that, really learned a lot from leadership courses as well. But in terms of lessons, I think that story I just shared about my classmates in my Tamil language class really changed my perspective on what it means to become a global engineer. It's not just the technical ideas, the infrastructure and design, it's truly about the people. Global engineers, you can build and design all you want, anywhere you want, um, of course, with limitations and obstacles, but it's the users of that infrastructure that matter the most. And it's the services that these built structures provide. It's the specific community, the cultures that grow into the infrastructure that integrate it into their lifestyles and use it on a daily basis. And that's what's most important. Not only how to engage in new technical ideas, but engage the people and learn from them to build infrastructure that lasts and support their specific um, needs and skills. And um, tying this back into my career, throughout my experiences and additional studies and other classes through civil engineering, I'm really fascinated by the role transportation plays in connecting people to each other and key services that help communities thrive. And I'm not just talking about cars, no. Um, I'm talking about the entire range, something we don't often think about in terms of mobility, just from an American perspective, whether it's a phenomenal airport in Singapore, um, a bullet train system in Japan, trolleys in Australia, mopeds in Saigon, or rickshaws in Indonesia. Mobility is fascinating because it really connects people to their communities. And so here I am about to embark on a whole new adventure in grad school, but this global perspective really has opened my eyes to the importance of transportation planning and systems as a whole. So not only am I pursuing something very important on a global scale, but also something I'm very passionate about. And if I have not expressed this enough, if you are the slightest bit interested, I really encourage you to reach out and chat with a current student or an alum so they can share more experiences and stories with you. Um, thank you so much for having me at this webinar. And if you have any questions and want to share more, uh, I'm sure Dr. Kennedy would gladly put us in touch. Wonderful. Thank you, Emily, for, thank for sharing this video. I propose that uh, with this uh, transition, uh, we switch to our GEM student and alumni um, panels. Uh, so uh, we'll start the, the session with additional videos prepared by four GEM students and alumni. Uh, one of them is from uh, Diana Chumak, water resources engineer in uh, Gresham Smith and Partners in Atlanta. One is by Sarah Lowry, a BS in Environmental Engineering 2020. One is by Ben uh, Weishar, currently uh, an engineer at Rogers Consulting in Washington, D.C. And uh, another one is from Solum uh, Obuchekwa, a graduate student in Earth Environmental uh, Engineering uh, in, at Columbia University. So, Emily, please start the videos whenever you're ready. I'm Diana Chumak. I graduated in the summer of 2018 as an environmental engineering major with a minor in global engineering leadership. 
I've worked as a consultant with Gresham Smith for the last two and a half years and I've recently started my graduate studies at Tech this fall. I'm currently on site at one of my projects. This is a wastewater treatment plant at the city of Atlanta, which is pretty cool. I originally uh, enrolled in the minor because I wanted to diversify my engineering education and gain a wider perspective. I also really love traveling, so that was a big bonus for me. The minor courses ended up being one of my highlights of my whole undergraduate degree. Uh, one of my favorite experiences was conducting a rapid urban water quality assessment in Cochabamba, Bolivia with our Bolivian counterparts there. Planning the uh, sampling from start to finish and presenting to the local community was a great learning experience for me. One of my key takeaways was that as an engineer, we can develop many solutions to one problem, but without input from the end user, the client, the community, our solution may not be applicable. So communication and understanding the application is very important. Currently at Gresham Smith, I am also very involved in managing the technical leadership program and mentoring of young professionals, which I attribute to what I've learned from this minor. And lastly, I'd like to give a quick shout out to all the professors in the minor who have helped develop my career to where I am now. So thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Lowry and I am an environmental engineering student here at Georgia Tech. I'm set to graduate this December of 2020 and I joined the Global Engineering Leadership minor back in my sophomore year here at Tech. I joined this minor as soon as I heard about it because in coming to Tech I always knew that I wanted to incorporate travel into my um, engineering education and this minor is an amazing way to kind of seamlessly incorporate travel elements um, into your engineering degree. I also knew that I wanted to get leadership and communication skills um, while getting my engineering degree and that's not something that you could necessarily get with just an engineering uh, major so that's why I selected this minor in particular. My favorite experience out of this minor was definitely the global practicum. For my practicum, I did an exchange program with the University of New South Wales, which is in Sydney, Australia, and I was able to take engineering courses over there for a semester. My favorite part in this was as an environmental engineer, learning about the differing policies and regulations between Australia and the United States, and then figuring out how engineers responded to those changes um, in their practices. Also, um, all of the classes that I took for this minor were my absolute favorite classes that I took at Georgia Tech over my four and a half years here. In particular, I really enjoyed um, CEE 4350, which is Environmental Technology in the Developing World. And I actually got the chance to travel to Bolivia for spring break, where we got to um, enact an original research plan. And we spent the entire semester developing research questions and methods. And then we actually got to go to Bolivia and do the field work and collect the data. And that introduced me um, to the field of water, sanitation, and hygiene and environmental engineering, which has had a huge impact on my career. Um, some of the most significant things that I've learned from this minor um, are, number one, how important cross-cultural communication is in today's society. I think as an environmental engineering major, um, the field is incredibly interdisciplinary and it's also incredibly globalized. So it's really important to have cross-cultural communication skills uh, when you're working every day in the field or in uh, diverse project teams. So that's been huge to have. And then also the concept of coming up with a project idea and carrying it out and completing that project has been huge and that's really been enforced in this minor. I've been able to practice that skill a lot. Um, the minor changed my undergraduate experience by exposing me to working with a lot of different types of people. Um, not only across the School of Engineering here at Georgia Tech, but across all majors at Georgia Tech through my different um, interdisciplinary classes and project experience experiences and then also through um, the travel that was incorporated into the minor, working with Australian students and Bolivian students and um, how they learn to be environmental engineers has been hugely beneficial to my career growth. And in terms of my career growth, uh, this minor has completely changed the path that um, I've decided to take 
for my career. I'm going to grad school and I will be pursuing a PhD in environmental engineering, um, pursuing some of these research questions that I actually developed because of the minor and because of the classes that I took for this minor. So I would strongly encourage um, anyone who's slightly interested in this to take advantage of this amazing program because it had a huge impact on my undergraduate experience. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ben Weissar. I graduated in spring 2020 and I am currently doing site civil design for Rogers Consulting in Maryland. I enrolled in the minor to gain a global perspective on civil engineering solutions while also developing my leadership skills. One of my favorite experiences was going to the Netherlands and learning about sustainable transportation infrastructure and how I could apply it in the United States. I also enjoyed interning in Israel and working with their railway system. One of the most important things I learned in the minor was from the course on finance and operations in engineering firms, because I felt like this was something that most engineering students never learn in school. So as I began my career, having that big picture understanding of how my firm operates allowed me to do my tasks more efficiently and relate with upper management in my company. In terms of my undergraduate experience, getting the chance to work with students from other disciplines helped me broaden my perspectives and learn how other people approach the same problems. Also, getting the chance to meet with successful professionals in my field gave me an opportunity to learn about work-life balance and the variety of paths to success. As I began my career, having this experience behind me knowing how engineers from other parts of the world approach problems, understanding how other students in other areas approach problems. That all gave me valuable experience that I can draw on as I move forward. And that's why I would recommend the Global Engineering Leadership Minor. Hi, my name is Salum Anuchekwa. I'm currently a grad student at Columbia University studying Earth and Environmental Engineering. I graduated from Georgia Tech in December of 2019 and the global engineering leadership was a big part of my undergraduate journey. One of the reasons I enrolled in the minor was due to the fact that I just wanted, I always wanted to work around the world and I didn't necessarily understand how this would look from an engineering perspective. So in order to get inspiration, I enrolled in the minor. I also enrolled in the minor because I thought I would be able to get a well-rounded view on what civil and environmental engineering entails, and I felt this way because some of the course requirements were classes I had previously never thought about taking. My favorite experience was definitely the Hyatt seminars. I really liked how the speakers had various uh, career paths and they were all different. really enjoyed the dinner afterwards. Um, I really like speaking to the speakers on a more personal level and asking questions specific to me. I also really enjoyed um, speaking with professors who I'd previously never come in contact with and just learning about them and their research. And through that, I was able to meet professors and ended up taking their classes through our conversation. Another thing I really enjoyed about the minor was the travel components for some of the classes. It was really fun visiting these places from an engineering perspective, as well as collaborating with students in these international universities. Uh, some of the things that I learned from the minor that really stuck with me was when I was writing for a non-technical audience and just writing in general, I really struggled with writing even in high school. So I feel like as a result of the minor, my overall writing improved and more specifically writing technical information for a non-technical audience and how to disseminate that kind of information. Another thing that I really learned was the role culture plays when doing business. Uh, for someone who wanted to work around the world, this is something I felt like was necessary that I learned early on in order to navigate that space respectfully. Because of the minor, I was able to get to know professors on a more personal level. Um, when you're traveling with them for a few days, you get to know them well. But it also allowed me to see um, how engineering translates to the real, real world. Um, so it was about learning these core basic foundations such as fluid mechanics, dynamics, and so much, but seeing how that would translate to your career or research. Another reason that I feel like this minor um, sh has shaped who I am is I've just been motivated um, just by learning about my professor's research, my peers' research, and all these innovative ways that they're thinking about shaping the future of uh, environmental engineering and sustainability. And it's led me to be more optimistic about our future. And also, I am motivated to be part of this change. So thank you guys all for listening to me, and I hope you have a great day.
Thanks. Uh, somebody is not muted, Myron. I think you're not muted. Can you please mute yourself? Um, all right. So now we are about to, to get ready for our live panel. Uh, we have uh, two students uh, slash alumni with us today. Um, Nabila uh, Kanam, a health systems engineer at MITRE. I don't know if you say MITRE or MITRE, so you'll clarify that for us. And then uh, Alexis McPherson, uh, BSc 2022. So um, please uh, join us uh, to the floor now, and uh, we'll be very curious to hear your experiences. I don't know if you want to get started, Nabila, but perhaps you can start and then uh, Alexis can add a few words. Yeah, that sounds good. Can everyone hear me? I'm not familiar with the Blue Jeans platform, so I'm still getting used to it. Uh, I can hear you okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Cool. So I did have a slide. Um, okay, but it probably won't show. That's fine. I'll just chat. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. My name is Nabila Kanam, um, and I it was class of 2019, which I don't often say, so just graduated last year um, with a degree in biomedical engineering, actually, so not civil or environmental, um, and I'm currently now a health systems engineer at MITRE, uh, where I'm working with um, different federal agencies on some projects. So, you know, I really was excited when Audrey reached out to me to serve on this panel because I think, um, you know, I am not civil or environmental engineering. I know like for anyone who's outside of those majors, this minor is interesting, right? Because it, it might seem like it focuses on civil and environmental engineering classes, but I think at the core, what really drew me to this minor was um, the leadership aspect of it. I know at least in the biomedical engineering department at Tech, it's very problem-based learning. We're always on teams, so many team meetings, and I always struggled. I know in my freshman and sophomore year, like, how can I be effective in teams and communication and leadership style? So when this minor um, was popping up, which I think I started my first class in 2016, so it was still kind of new. I think everyone was working out the kinks, but my first class um, was with Wes Reinens in Foundations of Leadership. And I would say hands down, one of my favorite classes at Tech. And if Wes is on this call, I love that class. <laughs> um, and I always suggest it to everyone. So I think for me, it helped me really digest what leadership means and um, the different components of it so that when you do engage with someone like what are you specifically looking at to better engage with them on a team so I think that has helped me um, not only throughout my career at tech but also at my job now when I am in teams and working with um, individuals that are older than you or I am the youngest person in the room and have varying backgrounds and how do I connect with them on that level I really say that class helped me in that um, and I know the other aspect is um, the global practicum. So I know that was a little bit of worry for me because I was like, that's a lot of money and how is this going to work? So again, coming not from civil engineering um, department, I was confused if I would get funds, but Ajo and the team were always willing and were able to give me the funds I need to go on that practicum as well as the other classes I took. Um, and what I did was I spent six months, I think in 2018 in Germany working for Siemens Health and Year. So again, that kind of aligned with my, my, uh, my major. And six months in Germany was a very long time. I got to learn a lot about myself. Um, but that internship, again, I was really using a lot of the techniques I used in the minor uh, with the global engineering leadership class with um, Dr. Bonaparte. Uh, we learn about cultural, um, how different cultures communicate and their skills. And in that internship, it wasn't only just German students, there were students across all of Europe. So it was very a very interesting dynamic. And you know, I really had to learn how to communicate. Case in point, um, someone was having like a, a problem in math and they're trying to understand um, matrices. And I guess the way I was explaining it, they didn't understand because some people don't learn math and English. So, you know, that there is that lack of communication. So I really had to like go through and walk through. So that was a good example for me of just like how you do have to adapt your communication style um, to who you speak to. And then I would say, other than my practicum, I also got to do um, origami engineering. I was part of Dr. Paulino's inaugural class. So again, while for that class, um, it was very helpful just to see a different aspect of engineering. I know. BME is very like health focused, but I would say like I did origami that taught me different like origami principles that might have health applications. And I also took the international 
um, disaster and reconnaissance class with Dr. Frost, which was completely new to me. Didn't understand. I it was a really big of a learning curve, but it was very interesting just to see how civils and environmental um, approach problems, right? And what similarities could be with other engineering aspects. So I would say I truly, truly enjoy this minor. Anytime I talk to anyone, I'm always like, you should consider it. I think because at the end of the day, what you walk out of it with is very great leadership skills. If anyone in an interview asks you, oh, so what's, what, what is leadership to you, or how do you define leadership, you'd be like, well, I took a leadership minor, and this is what I learned. Like, you automatically have an answer. I think also what you walk away from it is a really high um, emotional intelligence level. I think everyone on the call, you, you went to Georgia Tech because you want to be a good engineer, technically. But I think in the workplace, what I think has served me the most is just my ability to communicate with my teammates and understand when they're having a bad day where I shouldn't be making a request. And I think that has served me well um, so far in my current job. So that's all I had. I'll be on the call till 1. If anyone have questions, drop it in the chat bar. I'll let the next speaker. Thank you so much, Nabila. Thank you for this. I see uh, Alexis, you're online. Would you like to, to go next? Yes, absolutely. Um, so my name is Alexis McPherson. Uh, I'm a fourth year civil engineering student, and I'm actually like a very similar story to Nebula. I'm sorry if, if I butchered your name. <laughs> but um, when I first heard about the minor, I was in my GT1000 class my freshman year, and I was so interested in the traveling aspect and the classes that were offered. Um, such as the origami engineering class and the sustainable transportation and the historic structures, all of those like really caught my eye. And I'm like, oh, this is really something that I'd be interested in doing and I could actually gain good information from. Um, and I first I was actually talking to my grand challenges teacher, who's also uh, I saw he's also like a part of this program and he helped me get in touch with um, Ajo and he helped me um, by the end of my freshman year, I was actually enrolled in uh, the minor. And so through this minor, I've actually gained a really amazing community that has supported me so much. Um, and it's also really helped me improve my communication skills and presentation skills. Like at the very beginning of my freshman year, talking like this would just like really bother my nerves and because of the amazing teachers and the support that I was given they helped me to come more out of my shell and really push through situations um, and I have like a true better understanding of what I want to do in civil engineering um, which for me right now is leaning towards transportation or possibly water and wastewater management um, but one of the most impactful things for me was I actually did a minor in German. And through that, I went on the LBAP program for Germany and reading the culture map um, in one of my leadership classes was so helpful. It incredibly made all the difference of the trip. I was able to go into these businesses and understand why they work the way that they do. Um, their dynamics is so different than the American dynamic of businesses and that book really helped me understand on a deeper level why they work this way, why it works for them, why it may not work for us. Um, so that was probably one of the most impactful experiences that I've had through the minor. Um, but that that is really what I have gained. <laughs> wow. That's quite inspirational. All these testimonies are so diff different, diverse, and rich. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Let me check the chat box. I don't see anybody uh, asking any question. Let me let me pause. If you want to, to say something, raise your hand, chat in the box, or raise your voice. Here's the time. All right, I'm not seeing anything or hearing anything. Again, if a question comes to your mind uh, afterwards, don't hesitate to post it in the chat and we will account for it. Thank you both for your live testimonies. Uh, if, you, if you have time, please stay with us until 1 p.m. Uh, thank you again for, for your nice uh, um, words. Our last panel will give you an idea of the global footprint of CEE beyond the gel. Dr. David Frost is a professor in geosystems engineering 
with expertise in about everything about swords, in particular granular mechanics, interfaces, visualization techniques, in situ reconnaissance, and bio inspired geotechnics. In the gym, he teaches international disaster reconnaissance. He also has multiple long lasting international collaborations. For example, he has sent several of his students to France as part of the CE Gateways to France program. Dr. Aris, Georgia Campbell, is a professor on water resources with expertise in the food, water, energy nexus, environmental resources management, and decision support. He has been involved in several major civil and environmental engineering projects around the globe, virtually on every continent. He's for avoiding conflicts in intense geopolitical situations. So I'm eager to hear what uh, each of you has to say. I see uh, that um, David already pulled out his slides. So the floor is yours, David, whenever you're ready. Can you see my slide now? Yes, we can. OK. Uh, sorry about that. I too many monitors here. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, have a few minutes here to just give you a little bit of um, insight into uh, the course on international disaster reconnaissance studies. And um, we have uh, done this now for four occasions. Uh, unfortunately, the most recent one in um, spring of 20. 20. We had to initially cancel the Chinese portion and then reworked everything just to go to Japan. And then we had to cancel that as well because of COVID. So, uh, but, but the previous times uh, we did uh, trips to both China and Japan. Uh, we're able to do that because we cheat a little bit and usually try and steal one day at the end of the first half of the semester. We travel over spring break. And we usually try and cheat and steal an extra day at the start of the second half of the semester. Um, the, the course is really focused on visiting areas that have been devastated by major international disasters. And by that, uh, in China, uh, I'm talking about the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake. And in Japan, I'm talking about the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. But in addition to these natural disasters, I also bring in uh, elements of human-induced disasters in these countries. And so, for example, um, uh, there are a lot of similarities in, in aspects of, of disasters, whether they're nat natural or human-induced. And so, in uh, in China, we we part of our visit we go to uh, Tiananmen Square and remember the the. Uh, uh, terrible things that happened there uh, 30 years ago now. But also in Japan, we visit Hiroshima, and uh, that that really is a, 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 a very important aspect of the trip as well. Uh, this is the, the, the full slide I'm showing here is actually the official flyer that uh, probably seen posted around civil engineering from various stages. So I've got two additional slides with just a series of photos that I wanted to share with you and, and use to sort of explain things uh, as to what we do on these international parts of the trip. Uh, obviously, in the first half of the semester, we really spend a lot of time learning about where we're going to go from, and we learn about the, the various um, uh, sites we're going to visit, both from an engineering point of view, from an earthquake point of view, uh, but also from a cultural point of view. And so by the time we go on the trip, uh, everybody has, has already got a rich understanding of where we're going, but nothing beats the reality of being immersed in, in these environments. And then once we return from the trip, we obviously do some uh, major projects as groups to actually explore elements of what we observed, what we saw, and what we understood. Uh, several others earlier today have already mentioned it, but I think one of the things that, uh, first of all, I, I, I love about teaching this class is that, um, uh, you know, first day of the semester, uh, there's, depending on the number of students, but there's between 15 and 30 student faces that I probably don't know very well. And by the time we've spent 12 or 14 days together in an international trip and then the end of the semester, I always feel I have a group of 15 friends or 30 friends 
because you really get to know people to, very well when you, when you when you spend so much time together and, and essentially working together. And so I've always been careful to make sure that that when I present things like this, I include photos of of our group because we really do become a group and. And, and uh, I may have the title professor, but I'm no different than anyone else in the group. Also, we always make sure that in our group, we have a, a few graduate students who uh, we refer to as chaperones, and their role is uh, twofold. One, uh, usually make sure we have somebody who speaks uh, Chinese or Japanese so that we can uh, communicate more effectively in abroad. And then finally, I always say that those students also are, are intended to help keep me out of trouble, uh, because uh, uh, if you're if you're trying to travel around somewhere and there isn't an English version of a sign, you can get lost pretty quickly. Uh, the, the photos on, on the, the images on this particular slide, though, show a number of things that we visit. For example, in China. Uh, even though it's not what I would call a natural disaster. We go to the Great Wall of China, which is near Beijing. Uh, the upper right is uh, actually a monument to the, the Wenchuan earthquake that occurred in 2008. Uh, we always manage to find time to go to the Panda Sanctuary in Chengdu. Uh, the uh, image in the middle is showing a uh, debris flow mitigation system. And this is actually about 5,000 feet up in the mountains, where they actually have designed a system to try and prevent um, debris flows from occurring, as opposed to controlling them after they occur. Uh, and then finally below the, the picture is uh, the, 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 the Chinese obviously intended this massive dam structure with the pipes to help dissipate energy. But the intrepid group of students traveling with me felt that this was a much more accommodating um, dorm facility where everybody got their own pipe to sit in. Finally, the lower right is a picture that uh, if we went to the city of Old Beshwan today, we would see that exact same picture. And what the Chinese have done is they have literally preserved an entire city that was devastated in the earthquake into a full-scale walk-in museum. And uh, I, I happen to be very fortunate to be there right after the earthquake doing reconnaissance. But even today, when I go back, it still has the same impact on me. And when you see the devastating power that nature can unleash on human infrastructure. And finally, any trip to China would not be uh, fill, fulfilling without some, uh, some very nice uh, uh, Chinese food, uh, not American Chinese food, but the real thing. Similarly, for Japan, uh, <clears throat> part of our experiences involve both uh, uh, activities that are impacted by um, uh, uh, historical events, the, the, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. And so in the upper right, you see students standing on one of the tsunami walls. The picture in the middle is the structure that has now been built over one of the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. And the last time we went there, we were very fortunate to actually get a tour and uh, literally um, got onto the site. Uh, I'll point out that our, our we were all um, instrumented and our um, uh, uh, instruments peaked when we were traveling between the remnants of that reactor three and reactor four. But the good news is that radiation levels are now at a, a level probably less than you would be subjected to when you go to your dentist and have x-rays. In the lower right is an image of just how the Japanese are rebuilding the infrastructure um, that was devastated by the tsunami. And you can see that in the foreground is sort of the old bridge. Uh, that was completely overwhelmed by the, the event. And in the background, you can see uh, a, a much more massive structure, higher up, um, but also more robust. The bottom, uh, the upper, upper right is um, um, Mount Fuji. And depending on the time of year that we travel, uh, a number of the students have actually hiked up to the top of Mount Fuji uh, overnight. 
so they can be there and watch the sunrise in in the morning which is, is a fa fascinating opportunity and in the lower left is the building that is the atomic dome in hiroshima and this was literally ground zero when the uh, the the atomic bomb was dropped in hiroshima at the end of the second world war I have to say that that you know after the trips I always ask students what were some of the most impactful things, and quite frankly, um, the visiting to to Hiroshima always comes up near the top of the list because it it makes the students realize how humans can make really bad decisions. Um, the final thing is again uh, for Japan. The lower picture is Kobe beef. Because a trip to China wouldn't be anything, or sorry, a trip to Japan wouldn't be worth it unless you had some of the best Kobe beef in the world. And with that, um, I, I hope I get to see um, many of you in the future um, in IDR, and in particular um, on on the trip to China and Japan. Thank you so much, David. Um, Aris, whenever you're ready. Yes. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen here. Let's see, okay. Thank you, Chloe, very much. Uh, this is such an interesting, you know, and informative event, and uh, I'd like to thank you uh, and and Ajo very much for for having us uh, and the students. Uh, the course that I'm going to talk about is uh, we just started to 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 be part of the GEM program this this year actually, and so unfortunately because of this we didn't have any opportunity to travel. But I'd like to, it's called Water Resources Systems, is the CE 4211. And uh, the, the, the focus of it is sustainable river based in development and management. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, what this uh, class is about and, and hopefully whet your appetite to, to take it and, and be with me and travel with me around the world. Uh, as, the, as I say there on the title, it's about the management and development of river basins the sustainable management development of river basins. And in this class, uh, it's a complex subject, this one, I must say. And in this class, we try to do justice to all the elements of, of, of what it takes to, uh, to develop sustainable management of river basins. The first thing is, of course, to understand the resources. What are the resources that we, we have to manage? And this includes water resources, land resources, energy resources, environmental resources, and ecological resources. And of course, we have the, uh, here in this schematic, uh, I'm showing you one of the main river basins here in the Southeast uh, and in our state. It's called the Apalachicola Sarahuchi Flint. And it's uh, probably heard about it in the news because it's the subject of uh, litigations with the Supreme Court. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. So this is Georgia over here. This is Alabama, a little part of it's in Alabama. And then the whole river goes into Florida and uh, helps uh, support services there, very important services of so fisheries and environmental resources. So uh, basins such as this uh, also have some infrastructure, especially for water resources and power resource, uh, power infrastructure and uh, uh, agricultural infrastructure. So this is what the schematic is all about. But the, the point, of course, is that these, these river basins are very important uh, uh, areas for um, uh, socioeconomic uh, development and and uh, and generate a lot of services and and I have listed here a few of these services. Uh, of course, we have uh, water supply for urban areas, industrial areas, uh, irrigation for production of crops and the support of livestock uh, uh, industries, forestry, wetland services, uh, hydrothermal power, both hydropower and thermal power and nuclear power because these require water to be cooled down. Uh, navigation, fisheries, wildlife, recreation, tourism. So there is a there is a ton of activities uh, uh, that generate billions of dollars every year. To give you an idea, this particular basin, the ACF basin as we call it, uh, generates more than half of Georgia's uh, GDP, which is approximately $600 billion a year. So uh, somehow all of these services are related uh, or support directly some of this, of this um, uh, economic uh, uh, activities that are going on in our state. So, so we have resources and we have the services, and and of course we have to manage this this this. There are decisions to be made, development decisions and management uh, de decisions that have to be made to to be able to maximize the benefit of these uh, systems for the environment and for the people who live there. 
And so that's the institutional management context that I'm talking about at the end. There are many, many, there are many, many actors uh, that participate in these decisions and policies that, that, uh, that govern the regulation of these systems. And I have listed here, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of federal, state and local agencies um, that, that deal with different aspects of water resources and land resources and so on. There's the private sector, corporations and companies that actually uh, use these resources. There are financial institutions like banks, for example, that, that participate in, in uh, what is built in these systems and whatnot. Citizen groups, environmental groups, uh, lake uh, cities, uh, lake uh, uh, groups uh, and other groups, as well as the courts. Because eventually, if people disagree on how to manage and how to share the benefits of these resources, uh, there are lawsuits, and, and these lawsuits uh, eventually find themselves either the lower courts or even to the Supreme Court, if the lower courts cannot agree. And the whole point of this whole thing is to try to balance, you know, to, to regulate the systems and to make decisions uh, and to develop them in a way that, manage, that balances environmental sustainability. We don't want to, uh, to, to degrade the environment, of course, because the environment is the substrate on which everything is built. Uh, and uh, to, to achieve economic growth, but also to make sure that we maintain the quality of life of people who live there, and in a way that there is, uh, this whole thing is equitable and just for, for everyone who lives in, in these regions. So, it's, uh, uh, so I just want to tell you that this includes everything, essentially, and uh, that's, the that's why it is a complex thing to, uh, to try to manage. And uh, we, we have done a lot of work around the world in various bases like this, and so this course actually uh, derives from this experience, um, and others, of course, but uh, in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, another basin, which, is, uh, which we, we use in the class as an example, to illustrate the differences and similarities between uh, domestic and international bases is the Nile River Basin, which is in Africa, and has a totally different scale. And so this, this basin encompasses uh, 11 countries. There's more than 300 million people that uh, derive their livelihood from, uh, from the Nile River. And uh, uh, the, the elements are the same, of course. We have the resources, similar resources. The, the services are the same. But the, the context within which these basins are regulated is different. And so it, it's good for us to understand the differences, like I said, and similarities, because some of the techniques that, uh, that apply and are useful in the United States may not be so applicable here, because the laws are different, the, the, the culture is different, people are, are viewing these resources and value them in a different way. So it's good to understand and appreciate those differences, otherwise, so that we can be effective in, in, in helping people manage them uh, in a sustainable manner. So um, let me give you an example. So, so we didn't have the opportunity to travel, but, but uh, last March when I taught the course uh, this time around, uh, I was also working and supporting the Uganda government because they had this unprecedented, historically unprecedented floods. And so uh, Uganda is, uh, is at, the, at the headwaters of the Nile River. It's this country over here and uh, shares this uh, very large lakes. Uh, this is Lake Victoria. This one is called Lake Kyoga and this is Lake Albert. And so these lakes began all of a sudden to have significant amount of rainfall and began to rise uncontrollably. I mean, those, those, uh, the, the area of this lake is, is larger than, than England. And so it's not so easy. When it starts to rise, it's not so easy to stop it. It's a geophysical event. And so uh, what uh, I, I, I was involved and I'm involved with the Ministry of Energy and Water in Uganda. And so I used this uh, opportunity as I was, as we were going through the class and teaching people how to, uh, to write, uh, how to, to code, to develop models that uh, represent and replicate how the systems develop and how, how the, pol the decisions and policies, in fact, uh, uh, can be, can be uh, developed to, uh, to minimize the, the impact and the harm and maximize the benefits. So every, every week, as, as I was working with the Uganda government, I was also updating the students. Uh, I think they enjoyed that much more than actually doing the, the stuff, the homework and the things that I was asking them to do. But uh, I just want to show you, for example, that, that the, this involvement internationally uh, forces us to face uh, things that we don't, we don't necessarily come in contact here in the United States. And that's what sharpens our skills. Uh, and, and so this is, this is uh, there is some structure they have for power in, at the exit of Lake Victoria, which was the one that was really uh, rising, uh, and, and it was a big concern for, the, for, the, for Uganda, which was downstream. 
And so uh, th things like this show up. This is the area over here, which is the main or the main power plant for Uganda. Th this power plant over here, it's a hydropower plant and supports uh, most of the power production in Uganda. And so what happened because of the high floods, uh, a lot of this, uh, this debris came down from Lake Victoria. And uh, this is uh, water hyacinth. Uh, and because of the rise of the lake, we had the, the roots of these plants that were anchored initially on the bottom of the lake actually broke. And then, then the thing started to float. And, and they, came, they came down towards the, to, towards the power plant. And it was really endangering the viability of this plant. If, if this power plant were to go, that is, if it, if it was uh, to be overtopped and the dam was to, to break, then uh, all sorts of uh, bad things will happen to Uganda. So, uh, so the, I, wish, I, wish I, I think I will have to, to interrupt you. I'm very sorry for that. We had only about five minutes uh, per person. Five minutes, okay. No, I'm going to stop. Is running. Um, if you want to say uh, just uh, one yeah. or two more sentences. And yeah, yeah, let me tell you something here. Uh, yeah. The last thing I want to say, really. So, so the, the point I'm trying to, I was trying to say in the end is, I was going to quickly go through this, is to say, have we been effective stewards of these resources? And the, and the, and the answer is no, we have not been good. good. And, the, and the reason for this is, is that we have, we have not shown engineering leadership. And the evidence is clear. I mean, there's a lot of uh, deterioration that's going on and so on. Uh, and there's new threats that we have to address. That's why engineering leadership is essential. We, we have surging populations, climate change, and all these other things. Uh, so about GELM, I want to say, why is this important program? And, and why I particularly want to be a, a part of this? And that's because, first of all, the, the value of international experience, uh, I think everybody has, has indicated. But I want to say that there's, there's a need for global leadership, especially in water resources. With, and, and, and I believe that the civil engineers, and these classes that we have here, uh, we're at the crossroads of, of, of at the, we're the linchpin in this area. We're at the crossroads of national policy sciences engineering. And so we are ideally positioned because we see both, both areas to mastermind so solutions that are sustainable. But, but the last thing I want to say, uh, Chloe, is this, that, that we need to do more. We cannot just stop there. And because if we stop there, we're ineffective. We have to be involved and, and to, to influence uh, the, the policy making processes. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's something that's encumbered upon us. And, and, and in this class, I'm trying to make sure that we understand that it's not enough just to come up with technical solutions. We have another uh, responsibility. We okay. have to move thank forward. Thank you, Aris. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you for your engagement. I can feel the passion. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to see your class uh, on the books. Uh, uh, yeah. I see we have no particular question or, or chat. So um, let me move on to, to uh, uh, our closing words here. Oh, there's one question. Uh, let me read the question. Um, to what extent do all these classes relate to each other? How is the interdisciplinary aspect of the minor developed and integrated through the courses? Perhaps Ajo can take this question. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. So, Chloe, I'm thinking that maybe I can take the question um, in the chat or offline after after the, we end the event, just yeah, because yeah. of the time. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, so okay. We can go to Westland. Yes, we will conclude this webinar by, by some words of wisdom and concluding remark by uh, two scholars who play uh, essential roles in the GELM. Dr. Wes Winans is the director of the Leadership Education and Development Program for Student Life and he is on the faculty in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Tech. His expertise is organization and team development. And you just met Dr. Adjo Amikudi Kennedy, who is a professor in construction, infrastructure, and transportation systems engineering. And she is the associate chair for global engineering leadership and entrepreneurship in CEE. Her expertise is smart, sustainable, and resilient infrastructure and in communities, asset management, and engineering leadership education. And she led the creation of the GEM. So without further ado, Wes, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see and hear um, what I have on the screen there in my chat, in my, uh, in my box. So, um, I don't know if I have seven minutes of wisdom, and I don't want to keep everyone for seven minutes. Um, wisdom is a hard thing to come by, but I did want to share a, a very short story with you um, about uh, someone that I admire um, for the work they've done. And um, 
and their experiences and their willingness to write them up. Um, the person's name is Lauren Isley. And the person's name is Lauren Isley. Lauren Isley was a poet, um, a scholar, a scientist, uh, as well as an author. And it was, it was Isley's habit to, um, to visit the beach, uh, over the summers to do his writing and his, uh, and his thinking. Um, on one occasion, uh, when he came to the beach, um, he was, he was a little de dejected. He was kind of, um, wondering what to do with his life and not, not quite sure. And he was walking along the beach, um, one morning and he saw people just grabbing up shells and wildlife and, and he was just so disappointed with it. Um, and it made him even more disappointed to think about it. And so, he went he went home that evening uh, to his cabin um, and was despondent. The next morning, um, he was walking on the beach again. He's walking on the beach again and walking along the same stretch. And again, he saw uh, people just voraciously picking up everything on the beach. And he, he was saddened by it. But he looked around um, and out on a point um out on a point on the beach he saw this fellow uh wading in the tide pools and he couldn't quite figure out what he was what the fellow was doing and when he got there um what he noticed was that the fellow was uh picking up uh, the starfish <clears throat> that had washed up on the beach and he was tossing them back into the ocean and uh, there were thousands of starfish there in this particular location. And so um, Isley, um, um, Isley, again, you know, he, he said, what are, what are you doing? Um, why, are you, why are you picking up all these starfish? You know, it, it, um, um, it, there's no way you can make any difference here. And the star throwing uh, man said, well, you know, the stars, they throw well, and one can help them. Isley is astounded at the man's optimism, um, but he still feels dejected about the whole experience. He's just not quite sure what to make of it. And so he goes back home that evening, and then overnight, he contemplates this man standing out in the tide pools throwing the starfish back in the ocean. And he has a change of heart. And the next morning, he comes uh, to meet the man. And he stands beside him and picks up a star into the ocean. And then Isley says, and I'll have to read this part because I want to make sure I get it right. I understand. Call me another thrower. And he tells himself that he won't let the star thrower be alone in his mission to save a life one at a time. And there they stand looking out into the ocean, tossing starfish in. In Isley's book, he writes, but we pale and alone and, and small in that immensity hurled back the living stars. Somewhere far off, I felt as though another world was flung more joyfully. I could have thrown in a frenzy of joy, but I set my shoulders and cast as the thrower slowly, deliberately as well. The task was not assumed lightly, for it was men as well as starfish that we sought to save. Now, Isley was a very... He was a very um, thoughtful person, and I always um, try to take some inspiration from this little story uh, because Isley was telling us that it's when we stand with others um, and join in the work that leadership happens. It's when we make that decision to put our effort with others. And I can think of no clearer example than this program. Um, I remember when Ajo came to my office and we were contemplating this and all the struggle that it took um, to get this uh, passed on the books and done. Um, 
and now it's a great example of of how many people can come together and toss those stars. So my closing thought is uh, for everyone to throw your stars well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wes, um, and and thank you everybody. I think this you agree with me that this has been an interesting, informative, and even inspirational uh, webinar. So I'd like to thank the organizers of the webinar, uh, the CE International Initiatives uh, Committee, with the leadership of Dr. Chloe Arson, um, and, and I'd also like to thank all the speakers and panelists, um, and also. Uh, uh, our communications and development staff who did a lot behind the scenes uh, to, to, to enable this as, as seamless event. And I'd also like to thank everybody who took their time uh, this afternoon to be a part of the webinar. Uh, there should be a link in the chat uh, to the website where you can find, find out a little more about the minor if, you're, if you want more information uh, and also to apply to the program. Okay, if the link is not there, that's okay. You can just Google Global Engineering Leadership Minor. Ours is the first one that pops up. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to any of the faculty, the general faculty, myself, or uh, uh, Tracy Booth Miller, who is the CEE Academic Advising Manager. And so with that, I, I want to say uh, uh, thank you very much. This concludes our program. Thank you all for coming and have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>